If some of you were here a year ago in the meeting in April, I came back from a national meeting in San Francisco and I said, wow, this is exciting. I was blown away by some of the clinical studies and one of the drug, which is actually not a drug per se, but one of the treatment for prostate cancer is an immunotherapy. <coughs> Stimulates the body's with immunity so that it can recognize prostate cancer cells as a foreign or abnormal and have the body fight the prostate cancer by exposing the, the uh, prostate cancer cells to something called dendritic stimulus. That company is called Dendrian, and that compound is called ProVenge. And last April, when I was discussing ProVenge, the stock price was four bucks, and I think last week, after FDA approved it, was 52 bucks. This is not a stock pickers forum. <laughs> I, the, my disclaimer is, if you, lose money on everything, anything I say today, I am totally not responsible. Okay, I know a couple of people somehow decided that Dendrian was a good investment and made a little money. I don't see anybody in this room that bought that stock. Um, another drug that I came back from a meeting last year that was, I was blown away, I was like, wow, this is exciting, this is like, so revolutionized uh, thinking of prostate cancer. It was a second line hormone therapy treatment. The drug is called Abiraterone, and the company that was making it was called Cougar Biotech, and actually it's a lot Los Angeles company. And then Cougar Biotech disappeared from the face of the earth three months after I gave this talk because Johnson & Johnson decided to come in and says, I want to swallow up this company. So that, that happened last year. So Cougar Biotech is no longer around, and who knows how much Johnson & Johnson paid for that, that company. Now, fast forward. I have made, made three handouts. One of the handouts is what I picked up at a meeting I went to last month <coughs> at the LA Live, <laughs> the Marriott. Hotel. I was there because I wanted to go and see the Marriott, the new Marriott Hotel at LA Live. This guy called Charles Ryan is a medical oncologist at UC San Francisco. UC San Francisco is probably one of the four major centers in the country that their prostate cancer research is frontline. They, they, they define where things are going and definitely on the west coast UC San Francisco for prostate cancer, by far, leaps and bound is ahead of anybody else, whether it's a city pub or UCLA or USC or, or even Stanford. So, this guy is very, very knowledgeable. He's a medical oncologist. So I went to this talk and I was very impressed with some of the clinical data. Okay, he, he knows what's going on, he participated in these clinical trials, he designed some of these clinical trials, he didn't know some of the results early on. So when I went to this talk, okay, he was presenting the data on Dendrian, the uh, updated information on the Dendrian, the uh, immunotherapy. There is a 4.1 month survival advantage compared to placebo. So it was pretty clear that FDA really can't really have a good reason to not approve a drug that has a 4.1 month survival benefit for patients with prostate cancer that has used and tried everything else that is currently the standard of care. So, that I was saying that, why is this the most exciting time in prostate cancer? Everything that you hear it in the news by way of the Da Vinci, the cyber knife, the new proton, the new radiation. None of that stuff really matters at the end of the day. Why am I saying that? What changes cancer survival or cancer mortality? It's how do we control the cancer that's outside the prostate? No one dies from cancer of the prostate if the cancer of the prostate remains in the prostate. So the disease is only worrisome if it's metastasized or it's outside the prostate and it goes to 
other organs. Prostate cancer does not ever go to internal organs like the brain, the lung, the liver. It behaves totally different than colon cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, or other type of cancer. So if prostate cancer goes and decides on illegal immigration, the only country stupid enough to accept it is called Arizona. No, it's called, um, <laughs> uh, it's called bones. Um, if the cancer goes outside the prostate and ends up in bone, bone by definition is not a life-threatening organ, unless the whole bone marrow is replaced by the cancer. So you look at prostate cancer in a very different way than you look at any other type of cancer. Okay, because it doesn't go to the brain, doesn't go to the lung, doesn't go to the liver. So all the critical organs are never really at early risk for having the cancer do something bad. So anything you're trying to discuss about treatment for prostate cancer, whether it's an open radical prostatectomy or the da Vinci radical prostatectomy, all the discussion between proton, IMRT, seed implant, all the rest of it, there is no discussion at all if you read the literature clearly, that any of this stuff changes prostate cancer, either mortality or ultimately cause of death from prostate cancer. We are comparing something totally artificial and sometimes so stupid that it's almost laughable. We are comparing success by how much damage we don't do to the patient, not how many patients we actually cure. So this is the only cancer where the success is not the treatment improves survival. We're comparing the treatment like radical prostatectomy versus the da Vinci. Which of these treatments harm the patient less, not help the patient more? Same thing with radiation. Whether it's proton, internal, external radiation, IMRT, IGRT, we're comparing which treatment not necessarily which treatment cures the patient higher chance, but which treatment damages the rectum or the bladder with less frequency. And then how do we define success? We define success by stupid number that is wrongly interpreted most of the time called PSA. Surgeons de define success when they operate on a patient and the PSA is less than 0 0.2. That's a Johns Hopkins definition cited by Patrick Walsh. I still couldn't figure out why Dr. Walsh decided 0 0.2 was the right number. Why shouldn't it be 0, 0.0? If you have no prostate, no prostate, normal and normal prostate cells, there should be no detectable prostate antigen. Why shouldn't it be 0, 0.0? Um, well, Cleveland Clinic de de uh, de uh, decides that 0 0.3 was the right number to have a cutoff point so that anybody after radical prostatectomy with a PSA of 0 0.29 is a success. I mean, it makes like no sense at all. And then the radiation endpoint is even worse. People com compare radiation therapy post-treatment PSA by defining if the PSA goes down and doesn't come back up in the northern direction for three for three subsequent blood tests, that's a that's a success. That is used in all the literature until two years ago when the society decided that definition is so bad the false positivity is 50% of the time. So they decided on a little bit better definition of success after radiation, which is still problematic because it's only sensitive 85% of the time. And that is to say if your PSA goes down to whatever number and doesn't go back up two points above that number, that is a success. None of this is important. This is all interpreting numbers on a graph to decide the success of treatment but not have anything to do with patient survival or benefit as far as cancer-free. So all the stuff you're reading in the clinical trial and all the promotion about the new therapies of treatment is very commercial. It's so commercial to the point where the medical profession <coughs> promotes it, hospitals, the people that sell the Da Vinci, uh, if you go to their website, um, if you look at what they're quoting, it's almost like, is it semi-lying or is this almost like borderline on false advertising? Radiation therapy websites are just as guilty. 
So I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Just for the heck of it, okay, since I was here last time, I thought there were three, two other papers that was worth your noticing, and Mays can get you copies of this. One is from this very reputable medical journal called Wall Street Journal. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is an article that came out this week on May the 4th. Surgical Robot Examined in Injuries. It's actually a very well-written article because it's not written by a doctor. It's not written by the manufacturer. It's an actually looking at data and the economics behind why the Vinci robotic radical prostatectomy, the machine, is so successful. If you bought stocks, you'd be very, very happy in this company. If you are a patient that had a serious injury, you would not be very happy with choosing this procedure. This is not isolated. I have seen injuries like this at Huntington Hospital. So I don't know how many of these side effects or complications is accurately reported. But I think that I mean, there's a lot of bias in the medical and non-medical literature and the commercialism of prostate cancer is scary to the point where I think a lot of the information out there promoting any treatment is semi-lying to the public. Next very important article. Okay, this was picked up in most national press, including the Chicago Tribune. When it comes to prostate watch and wait, major cancer group endorses active surveillance of prostate cancer. The, the one article that I didn't print, if you want to copy it, Mason, get it. I think it was in the New York Times. Um, a guy called Abram wrote the article. And before I read the article, I have no idea who this guy Abram was. And in the second paragraph, this guy says, I discovered PSA 25 years ago and I'm so sad that this silly number called PSA is causing so much grief, having so many patients that is needing treatment that if it wasn't for this PSA number, they'll be very happy not knowing they have a very silly, irrelevant prostate cancer. This is the guy that discovered PSA writing the article. So in the mix of all of this, in the last three months, the American Cancer Society came up with a new change of definition of their guidelines. This is following the um, change of the national guidelines from the um, Washington, D.C. a year ago with the Cancer, Cancer, uh, Prostate Cancer Prevention Task Force saying you should stop screening patients after age 75 years old for prostate cancer. And the American Cancer Society guidelines are saying that, well, before your primary care should order a PSA, he should explain to you what he's trying not to find or what he's trying to find. And make sure you consent before you have a PSA done. Because once you go down a slippery slope, uh, I think sometimes it's hard to really sit back and look at things objectively. Once you start the wheel turning and you're diagnosed with an early low-risk prostate cancer, it's very hard for the medical profession who is like a used car salesman to tell you you don't need a used car, new car. Um, so they start arguing you should have a BMW or a Lexus and start arguing that a Lexus is better than a Toyota, it's better than a, than a Honda. Um, a lot of this is medical economic driven. The medicine is a pretty sad state today <coughs> because doctors are under two major forces of medical malpractice and medical economics and promoting treatment that sometimes our definition of what we are trying to do have no direct impact on the patient's outcome. I'll give you one extreme example. I can treat a 80 year old patient with a silly prostate cancer and have his PSA go down to nothing and I'm saying I am successful in curing another patient with prostate cancer. If he didn't have that cancer treatment, he would have been th just doing fine anyway without the short-term and possibly some long-term side effects of, of the radiation treatment. So I'm actually hurting him because the treatment doesn't make sense. 
but if a patient diagnosed with prostate cancer, he's 80 years old or he's 85 years old, it's hard to tell him you should leave it alone. It's hard for him to decide that, well, why am I not choosing something that because of my age, why are you kind of like, yeah, you're writing me off because I'm 85 years old. I mean, the, the discussion is very complicated, and it's like there's no right or wrong. So that's why the whole national debate is, the only thing for sure is, this is the only country where, where we are actively trying to diagnose prostate cancer. No other country has the resources or wants to do that. And what uh, all it ends up is, we'll help bankrupt Medicare sooner rather than later, because we're over-treating easily 60% of patients with prostate cancer where the disease is of no clinical significance. Now, this is not all prostate cancer. <coughs> prostate cancer is definitely not one disease. You have high-risk prostate cancer, low-risk prostate cancer, and, and prostate cancer that's somewhere in between. If you have high-risk prostate cancer, doing nothing, even if you're 85 years old, makes no sense. But doing a curative treatment for an 85-year-old also <coughs> makes no sense. So you want to pick a strategy of, maybe I just want to slow that thing down. Maybe I just want to stop it for a while, make it a chronic-type illness. <coughs> if you have a 50-year-old guy, okay, with an early prostate cancer, <coughs> the traditional wisdom or non-wisdom was, he's young. Let's go after this with our big bombs and our big guns and cure it. Uh, because he's not living another 30 years. The flip side of the story is, he's young. We're not going to start damaging the quality of life when he's 50 years old, and he has to be lived with incontinence for the next 30 years of his life. So it's a two-edged, it's a no, it's a very complicated discussion. That's why active surveillance sometimes makes sense because you're not trying to do something right off the bat by a reflex reaction. At the same time, you're not trying to lose an opportunity to cure it or to stop it if you and when you decide it's the right time to do something. So, but this is mostly for low risk and can, uh, prostate cancer. Someone with a reason four plus four, four plus five or five plus four, it's a different discussion. Doing nothing is stupid, doing nothing is you got to do something worse to him in two years or five years when the cancer has shown up somewhere else in the body. So the guy sitting next to you who had surgery is doing wonderful. For him, that was the right decision. The one guy sitting next to you who chose radiation, after he has done his homework, he said that was the right treatment for him. And it's the side effects are what he would be willing to put up with is the right treatment for him. The guy sitting across from you who decided that I'm not willing to give up any areas of my quality of life. I'm 56 years old, and maybe five years from now, I may change my mind. Okay, and five years from now, maybe your surgery and maybe your radiation is better, and I'll do some local treatment if I have to at that time. That's probably the right treatment for him. So comparing notes is a little bit difficult, okay, because if you sometimes comparing apples and oranges. And there's no model patient. I think the doctor's role is to try to be fair and give you today's literature and not to try to like tell you have to do. My last last time I was here, my title of my talk was the virtue radical prostatectomy, everything your urologists do not want you to, to know. I got so much flag from urologists. Uh, <laughs> And I think that, like, why do you want to rock the boat? And I told the hospital that promoting the Vichy radical prostatectomy with less than accurate literature is misleading. So they put the end. Now, most of the patients choosing whatever treatment will end up choosing the right treatment because they have done their homework. And because the treatment is so good anyway today, that they'll be happy. Um, that doesn't happen 100% of the time. And there's a Wall Street Journal article from two days ago is describing that. 
nothing is free. There's no free lunch. You do have to consider the worst case scenario. Um, one story, I'll give you two stories. I'm treating a guy now um, for prostate cancer and he came in and told me he does not want surgery. Okay. And the reason that he didn't want surgery was because his brother-in-law uh, had an early prostate cancer and diagnosed uh, <coughs> at like really early stage. He was, he was healthy and decided to have surgery and decided to go down to um, uh, this institution um, in East LA that's a rival of the, uh, the Bruins. Um, <laughs> He had the surgery, and in the San Marino Tribune a week later, or two weeks later, it says, patient died at Huntington Hospital of complication from surgery. Uh, patient died at Huntington Hospital, that's accurate. Patient died from complication of surgery, that's accurate, except <laughs> it doesn't say that patient had the radical prostatectomy at USC Norris Cancer Hospital was discharged in a major blood clot the following weekend, ended up in emergency room and died at Huntington Hospital. Uh, this was not reported because USC never knew he had complications from surgery because he was discharged and doing fine. So guess what? This brother law decided to the treatment he did not want, surgery. So that was easy. Um, Is that a deep vein thrombosis? There was a blood clot from the brain going up to the lung, and it became a massive pulmonary embolism. <coughs> I mean, this wasn't anything except it was just by chance. It was one of those things that if you take a guy to surgery a hundred times, one or two or three percent of patients will have some, uh, some complication from surgery. So there's no guarantee. So time, sometimes, okay, you have to take everything into consideration. Anyway. That's spilling. Go back to what I was going to talk about. Okay, stock tips. No, it's not stock tips. <laughs> Patients with prostate cancer, if the cancer has gone somewhere else in the body, the goal is to stop it. Stop it so that it doesn't progress further. Progressing further means that it will one day end up it's like you go to the bone, you overpopulate the bone, the bone loses its function of producing normal blood cells, patients' counts go down. Eventually, it's like you overfill the bone, it'll start to go out elsewhere. It takes a long time usually for that to happen. So if we have something to slow that down or stop that from happening, sometimes it's a win. Try this one just for, just, just think about this one. <coughs> it doesn't matter if the cancer is circulating in the body. If the cancer cells cannot pop in that foreign country and start having babies and more babies and more babies, it's not a problem. That's where Miss Abbott, okay, Lupron, Lupron is an anti-testosterone medication that lowers the body's testosterone. Why do we use Lupron sometimes in aggressive cancer or something comparable to Lupron? We can't stop the cancer cells being, to be spilled beyond the prostate. But we can change the body's climate so that the body's climate is very hostile for these cells that might be in circulation from going on and start dividing and making babies and making bigger families. So we put the cancer cells in a starvation mode. So these cancer cells end up, they can't reproduce, they can't divide, ultimately they get weaker and they'll die. So changing the body's climate is very effective in stopping the cancer cells from showing up somewhere else in the body. <coughs> we know that turning off the body's testosterone works because the first treatment for prostate cancer 50 years ago was to remove the testicle of men with prostate cancer and the disease quiets down. Fast forward, 
okay, we stop telling off people's testicle because it's pretty barbaric, and the fact that we want sometimes to for this process to be reversible. So we stop doing orchidectomy in this country. And stop buying drugs that's very expensive, like Lupron, <coughs> we put in the body every three months, every four months, or once a month, or every six months. Um, and that's very effective. At some point, the very aggressive cancer will look at your strategy and laugh at it and says, we're going to go into a different pathway and overcome this, okay, the brakes. The brakes will stop working. <coughs> So in the past, we have very few choices of shutting up the body's testosterone, except centrally, try to shut up the brain from producing a hormone to stimulate the testicle from producing the testosterone. Another drug is to stop the, can the testosterone that is still in your body. You can never turn it down to zero because your adrenal gland still produces some testosterone. So the next drug that is very exciting was the Abiraterone that Johnson Johnson decided, boy, this stuff works really well, so they swallowed up that company. So Johnson Johnson <coughs> has something that within the next 12 to 18 months, the drug is called Abiraterone, is a hormone therapy treatment, it's by mouth, that's going to come into the market, onto the market, and that will be a very successful second line hormone therapy for prostate cancer. The third drug that is very exciting is a very small biotech company called Medivation. It's also publicly traded. Now, right now, we have a medicine that blocks the cancer cells' receptors so that the circulating body testosterone cannot go into and stimulate the cancer cells from behaving aggressively. It's called Casadex or Flutamide. That eventually won't work very well because the cells will overcome the effect of the Casadex or the Flutamide. This small biotech company has this motivation, but I don't think it has a name, it's not MD3100, it's in that handout, that actually can block the receptor in three levels from the membrane into the nucleus. And the, all the clinical trials up to date shows it's very, very effective. And these are clinical trials not done by for profit companies, it's being that are done under the supervision of the National Cancer Institute and working with Sloan Kettering and UC San Francisco. So that's very exciting because we now have a, another way of stopping these cancer cells by changing the body's hormone binding. So we have the immunotherapy, the new drug, which is the Abiraterone, and then the third drug is this MD3100 by a biotech company that, okay, here's the part I should be saying. This, the stock of this drug two months ago was 40 bucks. After the meeting, I was like, I've never heard of this company. So I researched it, and the stock price was like 10 bucks. What happened was the other drug that were working for Alzheimer's that they were partnering with Pfizer didn't reach a the objectable endpoint. So the other drug that this company was working with is the Alzheimer's drug, bomb. So the stock price went from 40 down to 10 because of that drug that uh, Pfizer invested in. Well, so anyway, I think this is a, a drug that the literature is very, very encouraging. Probably in 12 to 18 months will be available. These are not drugs just for the sake of lowering your PSA. I can send you to Trader Joe's and use stuff on the shelf on Trader Joe's to lower PSA. Okay, the PSA is a marker. I can have someone that is on active surveillance and I can prescribe <coughs> Trader Joe's okay, stuff and probably willing to bet you a cup of Starbucks coffee, I can keep his PSA level or lower for the next five years. But that's not treating the cancer, that's treating the PSA. Okay. <coughs> This stuff actually shows survival changes. And when you're talking about cancer therapy, survival difference is the, basically the end, the, the end game. If it makes a difference, prolonging survival is a win. 
with the dendrian immunotherapy, okay, what it does is take your blood out, expose it to the dendritic cells in, in three separate occasions, put it back into the body, two weeks apart. End of story. There's no ongoing continued treatment. So it's actually very simple. Dendrian is going to charge your insurance 93000 bucks for that treatment. <laughs> and there's going to be a long wait for the first 12 months because there's so many people that want it. Um, so, so, yeah, a lot of this stuff is exciting because it's the beginning of a new era of cancer treatment. Cancer treatment 20 years ago was slash, 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 burn, and poison, surgery, radiation, and chemo. We have done very well with slash, burn, and poison. We have now great technology with the Da Vinci. We have great accelerators for treatment planning and, and all this IGRT, IMRT nonsense. Um, we have better drugs in killing the cancer than killing the patient with the uh, uh, chemotherapy. But looking ahead, these are all yesterday's treatment concepts. These are not tomorrow's treatment concepts. Tomorrow's treatment concept is stop the cancer cells dividing without hurting the host. We can do that by stimulating the body's T cell to attack the cancer cells and recognize it as foreign. Or we can stimulate the body to stop these blood vessels that's developed to feed the tumor called anti-angiogenesis. Or we can develop okay, medications or, or monoclonal antibodies like we have for breast cancer, like Herceptin and all that stuff, with toxin, to turn up the cancer cells' genes so that it stops dividing but by not actively killing the cancer cell. Just stop the cancer cells dividing, that's a win. If I tell you you have prostate cancer, the urologist will tell you you have prostate cancer, I think you're not going to react very well because the meaning or the mismeaning of cancer. Mm -hmm. If a, an internal medicine doctor tells you you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes, you probably don't overreact and probably won't have the, your blood pressure raised because like, Oh, fine. My father had it. My brother had it. My neighbor had it. My coworker had my diabetes and high blood pressure. Every one of those diagnoses will shorten your life. Majority of patients with prostate cancer, the prostate cancer will not shorten your life. So I think you have to look at the disease of what the disease may do to you. If you have diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol, your you have a huge health issue because you can't cure any of these. You can try to manage it and try to manage it well, but all of these will eventually cause problems with eyesight, kidney function, and all the rest of it. It becomes a vicious cycle, and you can't cure it. And prostate cancer, you can leave it alone. Most people with prostate cancer 20 years later will be doing fine because the cancer may or may not have a PSA that's higher or, or whatever number, but there's very low probability that cancer is actually <coughs> going to be your major cause of death. Even if you're 50. Mm -hmm. Even if you're 50 when you discover it. Depends on the grade of the cancer. The grade of the cancer <laughs> determines, okay, how aggressive you want to approach it. The NCCN guidelines, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, that kind of governs the uh, uh, treatment thinking in this country, 2010 actually established instead of low intermediate high risk prostate cancer another category called very low risk prostate cancer <coughs> conventional last decade was if someone's going to live 10 years okay then maybe consider treatment if someone's not going to live more than 10 years forget about treating him now this sus new category of very low risk prostate cancer says if you have very low risk prostate cancer even if you're going to live 20 years, doing nothing is very appropriate. And that's where this okay, reference of Chicago Tribune says the major cancer group, that's the NCCN guidelines. Yeah. If my facts are correct, I understand that the musician 
Dan Fogelberg was 52 when uh, prostate cancer was discovered in him, and uh, he didn't do anything about it, and four years later he was dead from prostate cancer. I don't know the facts, but I think that's probably very uh, highly unlikely. Um, and the reason is, if you look at the NCI, like his statistics fact sheet, the five-year relative survival for cancer, and if you want that, Mason gives it for you. Every five years, they come up with an NCI fact sheet. The top 25 or 30 cancer sites in the, uh, that has to be reported, on one end is prostate cancer, thyroid cancer, testicular cancer, and the other extreme is pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, and, and stomach cancer. Five-year relative survival for <coughs> Caucasian men at five years for prostate cancer is 100%, which means that even if you have stage four prostate cancer, very few people is going to die from prostate cancer at five years because we can stop it. We can stop it with yesterday's medication. And now with all this stuff coming on board, okay, we can change it into a chronic illness for a period of time. Isn't one of the key things to look at is the change over a period of time. I mean, PSA is one metric. It's not perfect. And if you look at your, you have an annual physical and you look at your PSA and it's 2 and the next year it's 4 and then it's 8 and then it's 12 and then you have a needle, needle biopsy and you have cancer precursors. The next one shows the cancer. You're really looking at snapshots over time. Uh, I think you need those, don't you, to really assess how bad the cancer is? This becomes philosophical about, okay, which national guidelines you want to follow and you want to believe in. And it depends on the, the host of your overall health and your family history. PSA doubling time is important. If your PSA really goes up two points in a year, that's bad news. Okay, that's an absolute. If your PSA goes from 3.5 to 5.5 in one year, two points higher in the next year, and that's a real, okay, because PSA can go up because of inflammation, or prostatitis, urinary tract infection, you had sex last night and you had a PSA done this morning, which is not a good idea. Um, <coughs> don't rely on one PSA. I've never had a doctor tell me that. Mm -hmm. And we, if we have PSA doubling time less than eight months, that means that the cancer is aggressive. Too late now, I don't know what's wrong. But we are now, we think we're smarter. We don't look at the absolute PSA number. You have a, something called free PSA percentage. So the free PSA percentage will tell you, okay, if your PSA is 5.0, what is the probability your 5.0 PSA is coming from a cancerous or non-cancerous source? So if all your PSA is coming from an enlargement of the prostate, <coughs> your PSA of 5.0, like no one is not to be anxious about because it could be just normal prostate producing a 5.0 PSA. And your free PSA percentage will reflect that. And then yeah, we that's try my to point. That's the delta. Once you get a base, <coughs> you have prostatitis. And it's a little bit elevated. If you see the delta over time, doesn't that account, sort of account for that baseline of prostatitis, for example? You have to follow a PSA at least for two to three years before you know what is, if there is a trend. And you also need to know that if you're taking some medication for enlargement of the prostate, that totally messes up how you interpret your PSA. Well, what's if the big deal about getting a biopsy? I mean, there's nothing about that big deal about getting a biopsy. It's what you do with that information afterwards. No, I mean, if they're finding, you know, a Gleason score of 4 plus 4 and, you know, it's 6 of 12 sample sites, I mean... You bring out your big guns and decide on your treatment uh, quickly. Three biopsies. And my doctor took 22 shots just to be extra careful. I think the danger is blanket in the guidelines mm -hmm. because you would be always either over treating or under treating. And for prostate cancer, I'm just making a statement that in this country, we tend to over treat all the time because of powerful forces that promote. And a lot of those forces are medical economics and the vendors who sell the uh, radiation equipment and the Da Vinci robot. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of people tell me to watch it away. I mean, there's no right treatment for anyone. Okay, 
active surveillance is only relevant and appropriate that <coughs> you can sleep at night. Mm -hmm. Anybody on active surveillance that got to lose sleep three days before the next PSA and going to be very agitated waiting for the PSA results to come back three days after the blood test, mm -hmm. you are going to have an ulcer and a nervous breakdown and you'll be having a heart attack and your cancer will never so that, that <laughs> then it becomes a, a different quality of life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this guy's good. <laughs> if, you have, if you're diagnosed with cancer and you do nothing, I mean, it's, it's almost yeah. impossible to just, just go about your normal life and not think about it. Right. Everybody walking up and down Lake Avenue who's more than 60 years old has a one in three chance that is prostate cancer in their body. If you live to 80 years old, there's probably a 60 to 80 percent chance you have prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. oh. And the autopsy data says if you live to 100, <laughs> if you the pathologist looks carefully enough, everybody is going to have prostate cancer. Wow. Yeah, you mentioned that. In every country? No, that's just one study from this country, from a report 20 years ago. Mm. I think that the thinking is, let's not rush into a treatment. <laughs> I agree with most of what you're saying, but I'm back to my change in the condition over time. When you're monitoring your PSA and you're having biopsies along the way, it doesn't, when the PSA doubles like it was doing for me and, and I had precursor indicators of cancer and then six months later I had actual cancer, the doctor says you have an aggressive, you know, cancer well, I'm not going to do. What was it It was seven. Three plus four. Yeah. Not four plus three. Three plus four, seven PS uh, Gleason's it's not recommended for you to do nothing. You don't fall into the, the subset of patients where yeah, active surveillance is What did you say? It's not recommended to not do nothing? Yeah. You're an intermediate risk, and intermediate risk patients, you're in turn to do something. Yeah, I had surgery. Yeah. So I mean, doing something doesn't mean that you need to do over cure. It means that you need to try to do something with an intermediate risk body. Yeah. There was an article you have family history that can guide you to when you should have the first colonoscopy. 